As I said, concussion is an up and coming, very serious topic that uh, is gaining a lot of traction both in the media and just in the sports medicine professionals overall. Um, and just this picture is showing is how many states have passed specific laws mandating education and specific type of management of concussions. And most of these laws have a couple key elements in place. Number one, parents, athletes, and coaches all need to be educated on concussions. Another part, if an athlete sustains a concussion, they must be removed from play and may not return that day until they see a licensed healthcare provider. That actually, that last part actually combined two of the parts that actually say they have to be removed from play and they can't be returned to play until they are seen by a licensed healthcare provider. Go ahead, next slide. So this is kind of a, a funny slide that I just threw in there. It's, this kind of displays the point that, you know, a lot of people are still learning about it. There's been so long that there's a culture of, oh, it's just a head injury, he's fine, it's not a big deal, not a big deal, he's, he'll be fine. But we're learning that's not quite the truth. You know, your brain's kind of important. We use it a lot, yeah? So uh, it's, we realize how seriously we have to take this. Go next slide. Concussion defined, it is a complex pathophysiological process affecting the brain induced by traumatic biomechanical forces. It's kind of a lot, a lot of bigger words. Um, basically what it's saying is you get hit and there's a, a reaction, a process that, a, that takes place in the brain that makes you have these various symptoms. And I'm gonna go a little bit more into detail in that in just a second. Go to the next slide. So what causes a concussion? A concussion is caused by an impulse, sorry, I don't mean to keep turning my back on you. Um, it's caused by an impulse to the head. Okay, so that means I could either get hit straight in the head or I could get hit somewhere else, say for example, in the chest and an impulse is set, sent to the, the head and the brain and thus causes a force, kind of like an egg yolk. You imagine the yolk inside the egg, you shake the egg the yolk is going to be moving inside of it. So it's got, that yolk is going to be hitting on the inside of the egg. Same thing's happening in the brain. It's, it's, it's like a little yolk inside of an egg when, when your, your head gets shaken around. There's something called a coup, contra coup mechanism, and that's kind of like what I just explained. You could get hit one way, the yolk is going to travel forward, and then it's going to have an opposite reaction. One of Newton's laws, each, each, every force has an equal and opposite reaction. It's going to have an opposite action backwards. So I had two different very me mechanisms. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about linear and rotational acceleration. What we're talking about here is the type of force that it takes to sustain a concussion. Now, what we know is that when we have a rotational hit, so we get spun around, those tend to have, you know, cause concussions that are a little bit more severe. They take a little longer to recover. Uh, the linear ones take a little less time to recover. Um, interesting thing about this, and I'm going to show a few slides to discuss the linear force, because um, we can uh, measure that better, it's, and we measure it in g-forces, is we have a kind of range of what causes a concussion, and, and it, the re reality of it is, as much as we want to say there is a range, there kind of isn't. It's just a lot of risk. Go ahead and next slide. So this is a, just a, a slide that I, I took from someone else who gives a, a concussion, but, or gives a uh, concussion talk, and it kind of gives a uh, range of forces. So me walking around up here, I'm creating one G-force. I'm one G-force a unit. Um, when I sneeze, it's about 2.9. An F-16 fighter jet roll is about nine Gs of force, okay? Back in the day, several years ago, we used to think a concussion occurs at about 100 Gs. We now know it, it can be sustained at much less. Um, but you know, there are some forces sustained in football, for example, or in soccer, where you're sustaining 150 Gs of force. That's a lot of force to a head. You imagine a 10-year-old that kind of has like that bobble head, neck, not a lot of neck strength, just kind of bobbling around, getting hit with that much force. Okay, it's no wonder these injuries are occurring. Next slide, please. So as I said, there's no real one set number that we say, yep, that's where we start causing concussion. It's more of a risk factor. 
Um, and th this kind of gives an idea of where that G-force kind of starts, where we start seeing some concussions, and then at some point it just peaks where if you hit, have that type of force, you're going to have some type of brain injury, if not a concussion, a more severe brain injury. Next slide. This is a very scientific slide, but I like putting it up here just because it gives an idea of what actually is going on in the brain. Okay, so basically what's happening is we have some neurotransmitters, and I don't have a laser pointer, I'm sorry, some neurotransmitters that are just spiking, okay? That's these guys up here. And then this guy down at the bottom, that's our blood flow in our brain, that's cerebral blood flow. So what's happening, if you talk about any major injury, so you hear me when I talk to people about concussions, I, a lot of times I refer, compare it to an ankle sprain. I know the ankle and the brain, Mike, you're nuts. There's, it's a little different, right? But in any injury throughout the entire body, it wants to do one thing when there's an injury. It wants to get better. So what does it do to get better? It's gonna send oxygen and energy, glucose. And how does it do that? By sending blood to that area to get that, that's how our, everything transports in our body. Well, our blood flow has been decreased. So although we want, our body wants more glucose, more energy to our brain, we, it's not getting there because the blood flow is decreased. So uh, next slide. So we have this problem with supply and demand. We ha don't have the supply. We have huge demand. The demand far outweighs the supply. Um, and so when you talk about what do we do after concussion, we say sit them out. And, and why is that? Because by further exerting them, number one, you run the risk of getting hit in the head again and making things exponentially worse. Dr. Pierre will talk a little bit about, or just simply keep running them. You're increasing that demand further and further. The more you run them, the more you exert them, you're gonna have more demand. It's, it's just the way the body works. The more you pump blood, the more you try to run, the harder you exert yourself, you're gonna increase your demand of blood flow in the brain, in your, your limbs, your extremities, everywhere. So that's why it's so important when you have a concussion to sit out. Next slide. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about, okay, so now we know why we're doing this. We know what it is. How do I know if I have a concussion? Several lists of symptoms, I'm gonna run through them relatively quickly, kind of give a brief explanation of some of these symptoms. Headache, t tends to be a pressure in the head. Uh, nausea, vomiting, balance problems, dizziness. Uh, blurry vision, sensitivity to light and noise. I always like talking about this one because um, everybody who I talk to, they say, how, how, do, how do you judge that? Well, two ways. Number one, during a soccer game, if an athlete just gets hit in the head and all of a sudden they're covering their eyes and doesn't want to look at anybody, chances are they're sensitive to light. Number two, you have, we'll call it a 12-year-old girl, and they're driving home, and they're turning the radio down. Good chance they're being sensitive to noise, or they're turning their TV down at home, or all of a sudden they don't want to be on Facebook. <laughs> the, very, the very key indicators that you know they're they're very sensitive to these type of things. Um, cognitively, difficulty thinking clearly, feeling in a fog, just being slowed down, not being themselves overall. They're, they're just not acting like their normal self. It's very, that's a very common complaint that I hear from parents and say, they, they, they just don't seem like themselves. Next slide. So two, di two more categories worth of, uh, of symptoms. Emotionally, you have people more irritable. And, and there's two reasons why, why I, my personal belief is there's two reasons why they're irritable. Number one, just the chemical response. Number two, after a while, these kids are, or anybody who's concussed, gets really irritated about these symptoms that they're constantly having. Uh, just feeling more emotional overall, anxiety, nervousness, sleeping more or less than usual, or just trouble falling asleep. And obviously those are things that come on, you'll notice as the, the concussion, go, you go through that management phase and it won't just be happening right then and there. Next slide. The challenge. As you noticed, all of those things are very subjective. It's a lot of how do you feel? What are you feeling? A lot of things that you have to count on a concussed athlete to bring to you. Now, I can obviously tell there's something wrong with this picture. 
as an athletic trainer, I can go out in the field and say, yep, there's something wrong, we're done, game over. Now, the challenge has been for so many years, we can't see a concussion. That's the biggest problem. And that's one problem with uh, the culture of sports that we're trying to battle now that we're, that's why we're out here educating. That's why we're stressing the importance of education around concussions. And that's because it is important. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean, yeah, you just shake it off, be tough, fight through it. You know, how many times do you watch an NFL game and they say, yeah, it's just a concussion. He can fight through it. He'll be tough. It's dangerous. You're playing with fire. Um, so yeah, the challenge is you can't see it. Next slide. So a typical concussion response, so from a parent's perspective, from a coach's perspective, what do you do? First and foremost, as we said, remove the athlete from play. Get them off the field. Calm them down. If needed, get them to a doctor. Matter of fact, get them to a doctor no matter what. But if it, their symptoms are getting severely worse right away, get them to a doctor immediately. But if they're just having those typical symptoms, there's, there's usually not a lot of rush, my biggest thing that I always tell parents, there are times when you're questionable, you're saying, well, I don't know, should I take them to the doctor or not? If you as a parent are questioning and you're not sure, take them. Take them to the ER, take them to the doctor as fast as you can if you are really unsure. Because with something like this, it's better to be safe than sorry. The consequences of something other than a concussion, something more severe, they get pretty scary pretty fast. Um, that's not meant to be a scaring tactic. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I'm just saying if symptoms are getting drastically worse very fast, it's time to get them to the hospital quickly. That being said, Dr. Peroth will talk a little bit about the normal healing response to concussion, and it does, a normal concussion does heal quite nicely. And just monitor the symptoms. When, you get, when the kids come home, just monitor them. Monitor the symptoms. Make sure they're staying where they're at or they're going down a little bit. Um, and just keep an eye on them. Make sure they're not getting drastically worse. Next slide. First and foremost, concussion management is a team thing. It involves physicians, it involves athletic trainers, it involves parents, it involves coaches, it involves administrators. No one person can do it alone. It involves everybody and everybody working together. And I think, go to the next slide. That's all I got. So I'm gonna hand the mic over to Dr. Piroth now, and then I believe we will hold questions for uh, after. <laughs> 